Hello, everyone. Welcome to our inaugural webinar in our newly launched series, Ecosystem Restoration Global Initiatives in Science and Practice. We created this webinar series in order to facilitate networking throughout all the programs within IUCN for which people are targeting ecosystem restoration, and there are a lot of them. The webinars hosted by the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group of the Commission on Ecosystem Management, excuse me, that's CEM within IUCN, and uh, both myself and Brock Blevins, who you can see in the video uh, window there, are the coordinators for this thematic group. And Brock will be managing the uh, technical aspects of the call and monitoring the video chat. And uh, you should be able to see links to the complete webinar series, as well as links to CEM if you're not a CEM member and uh, would like to learn a little bit more about what CEM does. We have four overall themes for our webinar series. Again, it's a monthly series. They include technical guidance, and we'll be leading with that today with my presentation, global initiatives, and these presentations are being done in coordination with another exciting webinar series, Pulse of the Planet, that is being hosted by Nature, Serve, and Collaborators. We have regional updates in ecosystem restoration, as our third theme. And finally, our fourth theme is really strategic planning for restoration within CEM and uh, IUCN overall. And our first strategic planning session, just to highlight that, is going to be in August. And the focus will be the World Conservation Congress and planning and all IUCN restoration event um, at the Congress. Um, I wanted to mention that this webinar can be used for continuing education credits for the Society for Ecological Restoration's professional certification program. And I've put a link to the certification program webpage right in this introductory slide. If you would like to receive credit for certification through the Society or for anything else, you can email me. I want to turn it over to Brock to introduce himself and talk about housekeeping for the call. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm the co-lead for the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to do this uh, monthly, and we have some great topics coming up. I will continue to send you emails as we get closer to uh, each session uh, with a bio and a little bit more on each topic that we're going to talk about that each time. And for this webinar series here today, um, the way it will happen is Kara will present uh, her technical guidance. If you have any questions, please save those. We, we will address those at the end, but if you want to type in your questions into the chat box as you think of them throughout the presentation, please feel free. Um, I will monitor those, keep those off to the side, and make sure that we address as many as we can at the end. And what we'll do is we will read your questions aloud. And so I'm going to pass this back to Kara. Um, for her presentation, and then afterwards, we'll, we'll get to your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brock. So we do have a full year of webinars planned. When you registered, you registered for the entire series. Um, because this series in, is intended to service CEM and all restoration through IUCN, we do really want to hear about topics um, for the 2020 series, and I believe we do still have one date that we can fill in this year. So again, thanks so much for coming. We're really excited to be offering this to members of the thematic group and others within IUCN and the restoration community at large. The topic that I picked to launch the series is developing effective monitoring programs for assessing the efficacy and effects of ecological restoration. And this topic is really near and dear to my heart because of the amazing opportunity that we have 
to accomplish ecosystem benefits and improve human well being through ecological restoration. If anyone had told me at the start of my career that we would have the global targets that we have today for ecological and ecosystem restoration, I would never have believed it. I mean, restoring 15% of degraded lands uh, through the Aichi targets of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, the amazing targets through the bond challenge, IUCN's bond challenge, and what's going on in forest landscape restoration is an amazing opportunity. But the difference, in my view, in whether 100 years from now our children's children will say it was so smart that we made those investments at the turn of the century, or, well, we did some stuff, didn't really accomplish what we wanted, we kind of wish people hadn't maybe done that. The difference is really in the quality of the activities that we do. And in order to improve that quality, monitoring, of course, is essential. And we hear often that there isn't funding to do monitoring, or you know, monitoring is sort of the last thing people think about. It's more important to implement than to do monitoring. Um, but really, I think it's about a culture of inquiry and changing the culture of inquiry and so today what I'm gonna present is the top 10 reasons, my take on the top 10 reasons why monitoring programs fail, as well as what we need to do to avoid making those mistakes. And you see I have my, one of my favorite cartoons here that shows spending 50 bucks to achieve an outcome, but then maybe having to invest a lot more in order to change what happened with, in this case, the tattoo. So um, thanks for joining. And I wanna mention a couple of resources at the start, my two favorite resources for quick reads on monitoring. One is a book, Effective Ecological Monitoring by David Lindemeyer and Jean Likens. This is a very, very short book, which is one of the reasons I like it. And it covers some of the things I'll be talking about today about why even if we have money and we invest in monitoring, we may not get the outcomes we want. The second is a more technical piece on um, some experimental design issues, which I'll be covering today. And it's a chapter from Don Falk et al's uh, book from Island Press, Foundations of Restoration Ecology. Okay, so there is really good consensus now globally on the importance of monitoring. But it's really rarely done, rarely done well. There was an excellent paper uh, from about a decade ago, synthesizing restoration efforts in the US in rivers. 30,000 river restoration projects were included in the synthesis. And what they found was that only 10% of projects included any form of assessment or monitoring. And most of the projects, furthermore, weren't even designed in a way that would allow monitoring of effectiveness or effects. So suggesting that we really do have a big problem um, in terms of proceeding with ecological restoration in an evidence-based fashion. But when monitoring is done, it often fails. So from my corner of the world, in the Western United States, and I should have mentioned at the outset, it was on the title slide, but I'm a professor of restoration ecology at a public university that has a strong ecological emphasis in the Western United States, in the state of Montana. And in the United States, we actually invest quite a lot of monitoring. The problem is not really money. Yes, we never have as much money as we need for monitoring, but we are spending money on monitoring and not getting enough information relative to the amount we're spending. So here's my top 10 reasons. The first one is that monitoring is not included in the initial phases of project planning. 
So this is the conventional adaptive management framework where you have project planning, project doing, and then evaluating responses to your project. And monitoring tends to be included in this latter phase, almost as an afterthought in some cases. The problem with that approach is that if you do not include monitoring in your initial project conception, you will not have the opportunity, as I'll talk about later, to gain information that will allow you to make inference about the effects of your treatments. So I'll unpack that a little. This is a slide I adapted from a NOAA report, a uh, federal agency in the US, and it shows engineering and management in the blue box on the left-hand side of the screen, in which you're designing the project and you're doing and managing the project. On the right-hand side in the light gray box is your monitoring. And so to have effective monitoring as this figure shows, you need to have an interplay between your project design and your monitoring plan design. If you don't do that, you won't have pretreatment data or baseline data in order to assess change. And again, I'll talk about that in my next few points. But there's other important parts besides the baseline data to integrating your monitoring plan with your project design. You won't have funding or enough funding unless you've thought through exactly what you're doing for your monitoring program at the point of project design. You also will not have funding unless it's built into your project design to export your lessons learned. Developing a website, putting on a conference, publishing a paper in a scientific journal, writing a report, reaching out to stakeholders. There's expenses associated with all of these. Analyzing your data. Unless that is built into the project design and when you reach the end of your project, the resources won't be available for monitoring. Reason number two. Monitoring is often viewed as a management activity that is completely unrelated to research. I have an anecdote from my college uh, and the U.S. Forest Service from the United States. So in the U.S., the national forest system will not fund research. They will fund monitoring, but they won't fund research. We do have a research arm a research unit that's excellent within our United States Forest Service. But from the forest, the folks who are doing the management, they will not fund research, they fund monitoring. Researchers, for instance, at my college, often view monitoring as filling up databases with information that don't get analyzed. So there's a tendency within the scientific community to not want to engage in monitoring, but to engage in scientific assessment. And what's fascinating about this is that in order to do effective monitoring, we need, in fact, to rely on proper research designs. So I'm gonna walk you through this. Research is the systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts, reach new conclusions. Monitoring, on the other hand, is in fact something different in terms of the general definition of monitoring. It's watching, keeping track of, or checking, usually for a special purpose. And that last bit, the usually for a special purpose, is where monitoring for the efficacy and effects comes into play. So there's lots of reasons to do monitoring that are unrelated to research. For instance, surveillance monitoring, monitoring the weather, implementation monitoring, did we uh, put herbicide out in the areas that were scheduled in our project plan? Also, there's a big emphasis now in the United States and many other parts of the world to use monitoring in order to educate stakeholders about a project. There's huge benefits to doing that in terms of building trust, but also in terms of adoption 
of new programs and techniques because of course restoration can't succeed unless we have strong social goals and strong social outcomes and commitments. And so this kind of monitoring, educational monitoring, trust building is really important. But again, uh, doesn't rely on any techniques from research. However, if we're doing question-driven monitoring in which we want to understand something about the efficacy and effects of a management activity, we actually need to employ the same approaches that we would use in a research assessment, systematic observation and hypothesis testing. So thinking monitoring is something completely different than research is actually risky business because we have broad agreement now of the importance of adaptive management. However, unless we employ effective designs, we are at risk of, number one, not collecting data that's going to be usable, or number two, collecting too much data so that the project budgets are exploded and unsupportable. Okay, reason number three, lack of clear management objectives. This was something that was highlighted in the article, the science article that I mentioned from uh, Emily Bernhardt's group at Al, where they found that the majority of the projects didn't have objectives that would allow for testing whether the objectives were met. So for effectiveness monitoring, if that's your interest, determining if the management program was effective, you really need to have specific management objectives. So consider this. Here's an objective. We hear this frequently in the Western United States. Restore historic conditions and reduce fire risk. What do you think? Is that an appropriate objective? Would you be able to monitor, design a monitoring program to determine whether or not you have achieved restoring historic conditions and reducing fire risk? Well, hopefully you're thinking, no, that's very vague. Because in order to have an objective that would allow you to determine if you reached your target or your performance goals, is what I mean by target there, you need to have these six components in your objective. The attribute, like resilience or fire severity, but then the specific variable that you will measure, in this case it's called a target in my schematic, like, and apologies, I have an acronym there, CBD, crown bulk density, something that's very important to fire managers. You need an action, increase, decrease, maintain, by how much? What effect are you going for, 20%, 10%, and over what time period and in what uh, geographic location? There's several other frameworks for defining what needs to go into a management objective. This one is from Elzinga et al., which is an excellent report available online from the Nature Conservancy. Whatever framework you're using, how it's packaging, this information, this level of detail needs to be in your objectives or you will run into problems with your stakeholders and uh, people not understanding what the goal or having different ideas about what the actual goals of the project are and therefore what you need to measure to determine success. So example, put thumbs down. Rephrasing, restore historic conditions by increasing cover of fire adaptive native understory vegetation in the treated area by 20% within five years. So I want to point out that what I just was talking about was determining the effectiveness of your restoration program. You need to have those clear management objectives. If you're working in a project for which there are not clear objectives, you can still learn about your project by doing effects monitoring, right? So asking, did the treatment have an effect? And if that's the question you're asking uh, or the area of interest you have, um, 
then you don't need to worry about matching your design to the management objectives, but you do still need to have specific monitoring or research questions. All right, moving on. Reason number four, inadequate experimental design for making inference about efficacy or effects. And apologies in advance, I'm a research scientist, and so I spend a lot of time thinking about experimental design, but in only having really a few minutes to share ideas about monitoring, I felt it is important to really focus on this uh, because there, I've seen so much confusion um, among the managers that I've worked with in terms of the types of information you need to answer questions about efficacy, treatment efficacy, or treatment effects. So here we go. There's really two categories of monitoring questions. The first is, did we reach a performance target, right? So you set out to do something, you had goals of your program, did you reach that target? And the jargony way um, to talk about those designs are endpoint assessments. It's actually not that jargony because endpoint pretty much says it all, did we reach the endpoint? But there's a different type of question you can ask you can ask whether the management activity that was implemented caused the effect, right? So in the first case, it's the efficacy of the treatment, and the second, it's the effect of the treatment. Excuse me, the first is the efficacy of the program, the second is effects of the treatment. Okay, so, what do you need to get started to do an endpoint assessment? Basically, you need a performance target, and that performance target could be theoretical or empirical, and that is very jargony. But by theoretical, it means it's an idea. It's not collected off the landscape. Uh, it's maybe prescribed by a uh, regulatory agency, et cetera. So in this case, 90% vegetation cover was the performance target for a large scale floodplain and river restoration project right outside of my university. Very interesting project where a dam was removed, Milltown Dam in Montana. If you have interest in river restoration, you can find information on that or contact me. An empirical target is a target that's measured um, like a reference condition. And so this is uh, a very common application within the field of restoration is to determine the goals of your restoration project in relation to a reference. I could talk for another couple hours about reference conditions, but just a minor tangent to the aims of this presentation to pause there for a second. In ecological restoration, the reference condition is not an historic condition, but rather what we're aiming for in restoration is to remove degradation and to allow the system to recover to the condition that it would have been in if the degradation hadn't occurred. Because an inherent property of ecosystems is that they change. And we need to be careful with all the types of management activities that we do that we recognize the temporal dynamics of ecosystems and build those into our references. Okay, that's kind of my aside. But so to do an endpoint assessment, we need to have a target. And there's some excellent examples of empirical endpoint assessments um, in the literature that measure progress in a treated area relative to targets. This is one I love by David Moreno Mateus because it is a meta-analysis of 600 wetland restoration projects. And here's one graph from their paper. The response ratio is the response in treated areas relative to the reference. So the reference again is that target. And so what you can see for vertebrates, macroinvertebrates, and plants in different colored traces, that over time, 
you see different amounts of recovery. So the uh, recovery of plants is in this case in these 600, across these 600 wetlands is occurring over longer time periods. The dotted line here is the reference condition. So points on the line are the same as reference. However, can an endpoint assessment determine if your treatment was effective? Well, no. The endpoint assessment answers the question, did we reach a goal? And in the example I showed you, the goal was reference condition. You can't use an endpoint assessment to assess whether there's a causal relationship between the treatments implemented and the goal. So if your question is, should I keep doing what I'm doing? Is it having intended benefits or is it causing something unintentional? You have to do an, an effect size assessment, okay? Which is jargony, it's basically an assessment that allows you to answer what is the effect of the treatment. So the question isn't the state of the system after compared to before, but rather the state of the system after compared to if we hadn't done this management activity. Okay, so there's several different designs that I commonly see people using to try to get at treatment effects, but there's really only one design that gives you the best shot at it. So I'm gonna talk about two really common designs and the problems with them, and then I'm gonna put in a plug for the best design. And then we'll move on to my fifth point. Okay, so first, a lot of people think you can do a before-after measurement. So you compare measurements made before a treatment to those made after a treatment on one or more sites. You really can't make inference about treatment effects using that design. This is cheatgrass, a really common invasive species uh, across the Western United States. And anyone who's been out in the field in the, this part of the world will know that every year the abundance of cheatgrass, the height of cheatgrass, the vigor varies. And that's because climate varies on an annual basis. So this shows Palmer Drought Severity Index. I could have shown many things over time from 1990 to 2006. And the wetter than average years are in the, this kind of aqua blue color and the drier than average years are in this kind of pinkish color. And of course, we all know this, every year is really different, right? So that has a huge effect on organisms and the environment. And so you would expect to see change between any two sampling periods. And so I like to sort of tongue in cheek say, let's get back to my previous slide, we could do an experiment where we measure cheatgrass in this field that we're showing here. And then we could do a treatment that is going in the field and screaming at the cheatgrass, telling the cheatgrass to leave, and then come back and measure the cheatgrass. And we will for sure see a difference in cheatgrass abundance. However, it will have nothing to do with our treatment, even though we would do statistics and find statistical significance. And that's because a before-after design confounds treatment effects with year-to-year -year or temporal variation. The other common design is a control impact design in which you compare measurements made in treated sites to those made in control sites. And so here you have another problem with your design, right? Because if we went to that same cheatgrass field and we measured five plots in one area and five plots in another area, we potentially could see huge differences. This is from a study that I did many years ago. Um, 
in which we were looking at a particular management technique and effects on understory plants. And you can see a picture. This is the kinds of understory herbaceous plants in that system. And we sample before as well as after the management activity happened. What I'm showing you here is data from before the treatment was implemented, okay? And so there's two colors. One is the area that was going to be retained as a control, and the other is the area that was gonna be scheduled for harvest. But it was all one intact forest. And what was interesting was that 17% of common plants only occurred in one environment. And 22%, almost a quarter of the plants in the system, were significantly more abundant in one environment than the other one. And the sample size, the replication here, was an N of 16, which is not high, but was actually the highest um, number of replicates in this type of study in the system that had been done. So in other words, hopefully you're tracking me, if we did a control impact study in this system in which the treatment had absolutely no effect, we would have concluded that the treatment uh, for 20, nearly a quarter of the plants was causing an effect, even though it didn't right? Even though it's just background variation. And so I didn't explain this graph. This is the frequency of each of the species. We've got the different species listed on the x-axis. And what I'm pointing out is the difference between the height of these bars, the difference in abundance, and that that is significant based on just spatial variation and where plants are. So hopefully I've convinced you that if you take a control impact approach, impact meeting treated, you look in treated areas and control areas um, without looking before and after, you're confounding treatment effects with site-to-site -site variation. Can control impact studies be effective? They actually can be if you have very, very large sample sizes so that that initial variation is not swamped. Um, by, uh, excuse me, so that your treatment effect is not swamped by your initial variation. Okay, so with this point, I'm hoping to convince you that this before after control impact design is really necessary if it is important to your program to know that the treatments you put on the landscape had an effect, meaning a causal relationship. And what you need to do with this design is you compare measurements made before to those made after treatments in both control and treated sites. And the response variable, what you're actually analyzing is change, the difference between pre and post at the control and treated sites. Asking, is there more change where we did the treatment than the background change? This is, I put in another diagram from Elzinga et al, who I referred to previously, because it walks you through the importance of having this pre and post monitoring uh, in control and treated areas with lots of replication. So this uh, goes from the limited no monitoring through doing a before and after, but not having the control and impact. And this is the appropriate design here on the right side of the screen for inferring cause and effect. Something that's really interesting to me is that we all intuitively know about the importance of replicating over space. So for instance, if you wanted to learn about a treatment effect, I'm pretty sure Nobody would suggest just having a single site in which you're asking the question, right? Because of that variation from site to site. But what's less often recognized is that there's also variation over time. I've put in my figure of drought severity and difference from 1990 to uh, 2006, how it bumps around. So what that means is when you initiate a study or ask a study about the effects of management treatment X, 
on important ecological variable Y, what you're actually asking is, what is the effect of this management treatment on my variable of interest in uh, a very dry year after two super wet years, or et cetera, the condition of the year you're working in. And you can imagine that that would have really, really important consequences knowing something about the year, because if you ask a study in the third year of a drought versus you know, uh, a wet year, you are going to get really different answers. So to make inference about treatment effects broadly, we have to replicate treatments over time. Okay, so I wanted to lay this out uh, primarily because you need different types of information to answer these different questions. So I have a summary slide that will walk us through that. So here's these different questions we could have in green. Were the treatments effective? Did the treatments have an effect at achieving target conditions? That's this jargony effect size assessment. Or did we reach our endpoint, right? Something a regulator told us or potentially a reference condition for our reference, for our restoration goal. And here's what's interesting. So here I have the requirements in gray. Do you need pretreatment data? If you want to know the effects of a treatment, yes, you need pretreatment data, post treatment data, and control data. You do not need reference data to determine the effects of a treatment. However, if you want to know if you hit your endpoint, you don't need pretreatment data. You just need post treatment data. You do not need control data, but you do have to have your performance target. All of this needs to be figured out prior to starting your project um, so that you can, if you know you want to ask a particular question, you'll have what you need. Uh, in addition, if you're assessing a project for which you were not involved in the project design, knowing this framework will allow you to determine what you can answer about the project. If there wasn't pretreatment data, Maybe you can't say that there's a causal mechanism, the treatment caused the effect with certainty, but you can still evaluate whether project goals were met. Hopefully that was helpful for you guys. We're moving on to reason number five. Those of you who are watching the clock, I'm going into these next points in less detail than the previous ones. But I did wanna mention them because as I said at the outset, monitoring programs fail, and it's, in my view, not primarily because of money. So my top 10 reason number five is lack of reliable data. And I've put a picture of a souffle. When we're cooking, we look at cookbooks, those of us who use cookbooks, frequently, right? Sometimes when I'm cooking, I look, I look again, I look again, I look again. We often do not bring that same level of cookbook detail to our monitoring. Now, monitoring is a special case because we need to collect data in the exact same way from year to year. And if you're doing permanent sites, in the exact same spots. And in order to accomplish that, we need to be very specific with the instructions so that if data are being collected in the field, field crew members collect the exact same data uh, over time, excuse me, following the same rules. So what I meant to say was they make the same decisions about collecting data using the same rules over time. And so in order to determine in your program, if your data is reliable, you need to assess observer error. Have different people make the same measurements and see what the margin of error is among your observers. There's a lot more to say there, but I just wanted to touch on that topic. Reason number six, why monitoring often fails is lack of adequate data management. 
I'm sure we all can think of experiences where you've worked on a project and then in the future you can't exactly remember what was the final version of the file or you open a file, maybe it's a data file and you have column headings that you don't understand, right? Well, hopefully we all organize our data in ways that are accessible to us. But for monitoring programs, it's incredibly important that data is organized and archived in a way that will allow others to utilize that data in the future. Because of course, monitoring often for different systems and different variables to know if you reached your goal or if there were unintended consequences, you may require monitoring for 10, 15, 20 years. And for those of you who are looking at my wetland example, the David Moreno Mateus paper, you might have seen that time scale, you know, went out for a hundred years and what those lag effects were. So you have to think about where your data is being stored. We're lucky now because there's lots of archival um, platforms in which you can store your data and ensure that they'll be useful um, either to you in a private way or the public in the future. But more than that, so that is one incredibly important consideration. But the second equally important consideration is that you have done appropriate metadata documentation so that anyone who opens the file can understand where the data were collected, what the data mean, and also where the cookbook is to make sure that future monitors are making, future data collectors are going to be making the same decisions. Okay. Reason number seven, lack of a data analysis plan. Oh, excuse me. Whoa. Okay, lack of a data analysis plan. Now, you know, I mentioned at the outset that um, if you haven't thought through at the start of your project and your project design, you may not have put in funding um, for this incredibly important part of the project, data analysis and reporting. So if someone's going to do this, then their time needs to be considered in the overall project budget, clearly. But there's something else that's incredibly important too. Unless you have thought through specifically the data analysis plan and the story that you want to tell, the questions in the story, you may not be collecting the right variables to tell your story. So what I always suggest for the, with the managers that I work with is when we sit down and talk about the important monitoring questions, we work through actually the figures, the graphs that we're gonna show, graphs and tables that we're going to use to tell the story once we have our data. And then we can look at those axes of the graphs, the actual data that we need to make those graphs and build those into our questions and our protocols and designs so that in the end, we're not making decisions about how we're gonna manage and, and analyze our data once it's all come in. We already know exactly what we're gonna do um, before any data is collected. And this is a piece that's, that's often missing. And I think it's missing, again, from one of my previous points in this disconnect between monitoring and um, science. Similarly, reason number eight, lack of a communication plan. So different projects have different goals. I think those of us who work within IUCN and CEM and the larger restoration community would all agree on the importance beyond your particular project of sharing results. So for instance, if I'm working on a particular type of restoration and have seen amazing outcomes, it's imperative to share that you know, across the global community so others can replicate. Similarly, if I've been doing some treatments intended to have benefits to be restorative, but they're actually having serious adverse consequences, 
it's important to get that information out in the global commons. There's also, of course, clear benefits for your own project and program if you're going to be doing, you know, repeat treatments so you can apply evidence in that adaptive management way. But I wanted to highlight the former um, and just encourage contribution to this global commons. And there's lots of ways to do it. There's the Society for Ecological Restoration has uh, Restoration Ecology, which is the flagship journal in the field, amazing journal. They have a section in which you can report your spectacular failures, right? It's not called spectacular failures, it's called setbacks and surprises. But it's amazing that um, this journal is providing that opportunity for sharing. There's also Ecological Restoration, which has Restoration Notes. This is a journal that's uh, produced at a University of Wisconsin. And I mention this because it's really accessible for practitioners um, because they have a very short format report out of project results rather than um, ensuring that uh, these longer articles with a conceptual basis. It's just right to the chase. What'd you do? What'd you find out? There are many, many other venues for sharing results through project websites, scientific publications, etc. Each project may have different goals, but it's important to think through what kinds of communication you want to do at your local level to stakeholders, you know, to the scientific community, to the management community. Reason nine, lack of an assessment of the efficacy of the monitoring program itself. So your monitoring is about the efficacy of your treatments, right? However, there is a need to assess how effective your monitoring program is at answering the questions that you want to answer. And it is incredibly powerful to do this you can ask questions about your design that may allow you to reduce the number of samples. And this was the case in the work that I've been collaborating on at this very large floodplain uh, and river restoration site, again, uh, near my university in Western Montana on the Clark Fork River, in which we were able to reduce our sampling budget uh, by two thirds after we did our first sampling by assessing the efficacy of the monitoring program. In addition, we had to drop some variables for which it we would have need to collect too many samples, way, way, way too many that we could handle in our program. Um, we were never gonna be able to answer those questions well. So this is an incredibly important part of any monitoring program. That brings me to reason number 10. So this reason is not a new reason. It's wrapping up my previous points, which is that monitoring is usually done in the context of a plan, the plan to collect some data, rather than a program. And so my circles here are suggesting the elements that I would include in building an effective monitoring program, which is starting at the top, you need your questions, you need the data collection to occur in that reliable way with low observer error. You need to have a plan for data management and storage, a plan for data analysis and interpretation, how you're gonna accomplish technology transfer and adaptive management, and then assessing the effectiveness of your monitoring program. And if these elements are in place, we will be able to better leverage the money that we spend on monitoring in order to ask questions and actually get some answers about the efficacy and effects of ecological ecosystem restoration treatments. So just one sort of caveat before I close, not really caveat, but something to think about. We do lots of things in our lives that we don't monitor. For instance, we purchase light bulbs, we plug, you know, insert them, and we expect the light will come on and it will last a certain amount of time and we don't need to monitor. 
So sometimes I worry in this topic of monitoring that manager, scientists, public feel that we need to monitor every single treatment in the same way. However, we really should be reserving our monitoring activities for the biggest questions that we have, because given limited amount of time and energy, we need to prioritize those so we can answer them well. Similarly, I think it would be more effective to collaborate with others who are working on similar types of treatments to design monitoring programs across multiple sites rather than having each different project work on monitoring their own site but not being able to do it in a way that's really effective. So with that, I'll close with again my, my image from cartoon stock of someone spending 50 bucks to get a tattoo, but then it costs $10,000 to kind of fix um, and remove the tattoo. In ecological restoration, we have an amazing opportunity right now. We have money to spend. We, we have a global public that is investing in restoration and they're doing it really because we believe that we can achieve strong ecosystem benefits and we can improve human well-being. And I, you know, I hope that as this restoration agenda unfolds over the next hundred years, that we can learn from the treatments that we're implementing and improve what we do every decade so that this decade can really be, excuse me, this century can really be the century for reversing the pattern of degradation across the globe. I've put my uh, email at the bottom. It's also in a lot of the information that's been sent out. And I really thank everyone for joining us for this first webinar and for listening to my presentation. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Brock. Thank you very much, uh, Kara. Great presentation. And in fact, I do have one that came in um, while you were presenting. And you can see it in the chat box there. Yeah, where is the Congress in, in August? Um, I believe the 2020 World Conservation Congress is what we're referring to. Okay, let me clarify. So at the beginning, before I started my presentation, I talked about the themes for the webinar series. And we have four themes. One of them is strategic planning for the Ecological Restoration Thematic Group within the Commission on Ecosystem Management. And we're going to be holding one of our webinars on this idea of strategic planning. It's scheduled for August, and specifically what we aim to plan during that call, excuse me, during that webinar, is events for IUCN's 2020 World Conservation Congress, which is in, in France in June of 2020. So in August of 2019, and this is a monthly webinar series, our webinar in August will be on planning for the Conservation Congress. Hopefully that makes sense. What if my research takes place after the intervention and has already been implemented? I don't have any before data and thus a Baki design is not applicable. Thank you so much for asking that question. It's a great question, I'm gonna answer that and then also talk about one additional factor that I didn't mention. So the reason I wanted to make spend so much time in the presentation on this before after control impact design but also talk about these two types of questions is because often there isn't pretreatment data right if you don't have pretreatment data you can still look after treatment and see what happened right you can see after treatment and you can compare to your target to see if goals were met. You may not be able to establish causality, but you can still report out, oh, we came really close to that target, or we were shooting for 80 pairs of breeding birds, and you know we got 70, so we're doing pretty good for the project goals. It may be difficult, you won't actually be able to say, we know for certain that this treatment that we did is the reason we got to 70 pairs of breeding birds. 
but you can still report that out. And you can also think about what other factors besides the treatment could have come into play and make a case for, you know, whether or not the treatment was effective, but you can't prove causality, but you can still look at whether or not you achieved project goals. And if you go back to the grid that I made, it talks about the kinds of questions, or it's a guide to the different kinds of questions and what data you need. Okay, my other point, uh, even though no one asked this question yet, is that yes, in restoration, we're working in the real landscape and we're not designing experiments that are perfectly replicated um, and, um, you know, in, in a way that you might if you were doing research, right? And that's okay too. I do not want people to leave thinking that it's not worth monitoring unless your design is perfect because even in research, it never will be. Rather, if you have limitations to your design, which you always will, it's important to think about and disclose whether or not those limitations, the ways you think those limitations might be affecting your ability to make inference. And I had a series of slides concerning that, what to do when you don't have controls what to do um, you know, in different situations, but for the interest of time, I didn't take them out. But I love to talk about monitoring. In my role with CEM and the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group, technical guidance is something important in my role. And so I would be happy to have any of you contact me um, with questions about monitoring and we can, if I can't answer, we can ferret out to within the CM network to try to find someone who can, can help. And also, uh, I recognize that we have incredible expertise among all of you who are participating. Um, and so, you know, hopefully through the webinar series and um, increasing engagement with the thematic group, um, we'll be able to connect people and get questions answered. Wow, I, that was a very long response, sorry. Let's see. There's another we're one actually, on the bond challenge. We're actually right at time. So I'll ask, answer this one on the bond challenge. Feel free to drop off, of course, um, and then we'll wrap up. Um, does the bond challenge have a monitoring plan linked to good questions? This is a really large topic and one that can't be um, addressed in the negative two minutes that we have, but it's a great teaser for our upcoming webinar on forest landscape restoration and the bond challenge where we'll be talking about the barometer and achievements. And I will definitely make sure that we spend time on monitoring. But I'll, I'll say that really there's a lot of focus on implementation monitoring and now the community is trying to work through exactly how we can work on this effective monitoring piece. So with that, I'll close. Please do do the survey. Um, email Brock and I with questions, commentaries, or in any way we can help. And we're just really grateful to all of you for participating. Thank you. Okay, bye everyone. Have a great day, everybody. Hope to see you next time.